Okay, well, while I was trying to find my speakers, they were all already here. So, uh, as a result of the chair being late, let me introduce myself so you'll all remember who made you late. Diane Gibson, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Health at the University of Canberra. This is, of course, the famous after lunch session when everyone feels a little slow, but you won't, I know, because we have uh, three terrific speakers. So if I can uh, call uh, Karen up here, and while she walks, I'll read her very long title. So, Professor Karen Anstey, Director of the Centre for Research on Aging, Health and Wellbeing, and Director of the Dementia Collaborative Research Centre, Early Diagnosis and Prevention, ANU, and Chief Investigator, CEPA. I did try to do it all in one breath, but I found. Thanks, Diane. Um, good afternoon. So I'm talking about enhancing cognitive capacities over the lifespan. Uh, first of all, I'll define um, optimal cognitive development and then put forward arguments about why we would want to enhance cognitive capacities, introduce four key ideas in understanding um, what we need to know to enhance cognitive capacity. Um, that's taking a life course approach, the concept of re reserve capacity, neuroplasticity, and the fact that we need a multi-domain approach to influences on cognitive function. And then I'll put forward the, or describe the CHELM framework for public policy. So optimal cognitive development is the highest level of cognitive function reached in each cognitive domain given a person's biological and genetic disposition and the highest possible maintenance of cognitive function over the adult life course. Why should we aim for optimal cognitive development? Well, um, as we've heard today, we want to retain productivity in the workforce and in society. So obviously, if we keep people's intellectual capacities at optimal um, level, they will remain productive in the workforce. Um, we know that having a higher baseline cognitive function um, reduce, reduces your risk of late life dementia, and we know that better cognitive function is associated with better quality of life and ageing well. So I just wanted to talk about the life course. Um, there's two parts of the trajectory in cognitive development that influence how you will end up cognitively. So. Um, we're all interested in ageing well, and in, in terms of our cognitive trajectory, we want to end up as high as possible in late life so that we can enjoy everything that life has to offer and we can remain productive members of society. But there's two components to this developmental trajectory. The, the first component that we need to think about is the peak that's achieved in mid-adulthood. So, um, and then the second component is the rate of change of that decline. So those two components um, are have different causal factors or different drivers that influence them over, over the life course. And they're the things that we need to look at in terms of public policy. Now, what we don't know at the moment is how much we could actually improve cognitive function in late life. What could we actually strive for? What's the optimal we could ever achieve? And at the moment, science hasn't told us that. Just another idea that's important um, when we're looking at cognitive enhancement um, uh, is that there's we all know about dementia. Dementia is severe cognitive impairment that, that is associated with uh, great functional disability and incapacity to function in your environment, needing a lot of medical care. We know about normal ageing, but there's actually an intermediary um, phase called mild cognitive impairment that a lot of people experience, and they may not necessarily go on to develop dementia. And this is very important because a lot of people have mild cognitive impairment in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, and that impacts on quality of life. So, in fact, the US um, data show that 20% of adults age 70 and older have mild cognitive impairment. So if we can actually change that trajectory of cognitive development over the life course by either increasing the peak or, or uh, changing that slope, we will reduce the number of people who experience this mild cognitive impairment. Now, we've looked at mild cognitive impairment in the canberra queanbeyan region in a population-based study called Path Through Life, and we found that of people who went on to become um, cognitively impaired without dementia, within a 10-year period, if we looked back when they were 60 to 64, they had one-third the chance of being employed. They were more likely to be on the full pension and to have left the labour force because of health reasons, and they were less likely to be volunteering and participating in um, social activity. So this mild cognitive impairment, it's not dementia, but it really impacts on capacity to, to age well and productively. So we need to take a life course approach, and the most famous depiction of this is by Bebington in the Nature article, when he describes, Bebington and colleagues describe 
um, Mental Capital Over the Life Course. This is a UK um, publication. Mental capital in that publication refers to both mental well-being and cognitive well-being. But the idea that they put forward, which has been really influential, is that mental capital is, a, is an actual resource that society needs to invest in. Um, it's not something that just happens um, on its own and it actually has an economic value. And I just wanted to give you an example of how we need to take a life course approach um, to cognitive, to influences on cognitive function. This is again taken from our, our Path Through Life project. And this time we look at the influence of smoking on cognitive function in three age groups uh, in the 20s, 40s and 60s. And you can see in this, these two slides, these are two different cognitive tests that smokers who are depicted by the red line at all stages and all ages have uh, poorer cognitive test scores than non-smokers. So they start off with poorer test scores which suggests that there's a selection effect and that people who smoke tend to be slightly different in their initial cognitive test scores. But what's important is that by the 60s, the difference in the two um, slopes is, is larger and the difference in the decline on this test is actually statistically significant. So smokers are also declining more rapidly. The next concept I want to talk about is reserve capacity. Um, this is, so we need to understand life course. We need to understand that, that the brain and cognition also have capacity to build reserve, and that's part of that building that peak in early life. The, res, the idea of reserve capacity came, it was, came about in 1988 in this very famous autopsy study, and it's now fed into a lot of psychological research on cognitive reserve, and it's important in us understanding how to enhance cognitive abilities over the life course. So in this study, 137 nursing home residents were assessed at autopsy. So before they died, we knew whether or not they had dementia. And what was really interesting was, and they looked at the brains of these people, 55% had Alzheimer's pathology, which is about what you'd expect. 11% had other neuropathology. 11% had no neuropathology. But what was really interesting were these nine normal subjects that had significant amounts of Alzheimer's pathology in their brains. And the only explanation that the authors could come up with was that these people have something else, some sort of buffer or reserve capacity that enables their brain to sustain the impact of Alzheimer's pathology where other people's brains can't. And this idea has now been extended. It's been shown in many, many other autopsy studies and studies um, over the life course, and there's a whole field of research now in cognitive reserve. But it's that, that concept I think is really important in terms of us developing a really broad view about enhancing cognitive capacity, that there is something that can be done for some people that actually provides a buffer against cognitive decline. Um, more recently, there's been fMRI studies that have linked um, this cognitive reserve to neural substrates. Um, so I'm just, this is just to illustrate the fact that this research has now got quite a significant neuroscience underpinning. The other concept that we need to have to put this big picture together is neuroplasticity, which links very much to, neuro, to a cognitive reserve. So we now view the brain as permanently plastic. So in the past, we were taught that you were born with a fixed number of brain cells and that they just um, they just dropped off over the life course, whereas now we know that there's neuroplasticity. We can even have neurogenesis into late life. For example, we've shown in animal models um, that, that even animals through exercise can have a neurogenesis of the hippocampus. Um, for optimal cognitive development, we want to use this, the brain's capacity for plasticity in the most constructive way. We can have neuroplasticity that's not adaptive, and that's not what we want to strive for. We want to strive for adaptive plasticity through interventions. Um, there's now been a lot of work done on children showing that things like music lessons lead to um, more uh, cortical connections. And there's a lot of work now in ageing, looking at cognitive training in all sorts of groups, showing that um, we've got enlarged um, grey matter in some, with some interventions. I just want to give you an example of plasticity that hopefully people here in the audience can relate to. This study was done on middle-aged and older adults and it was quite a simple intervention of speed of processing training. It was published last year in PLOS One. Um, this study had over 600 participants, so randomly assigned to three groups. Two of the groups actually did the speed of processing training. It's an online computer game, um, and one group did it at home, one group did it in a lab, and there was an attention control group. Um, it was only a 10-hour intervention, which is quite incredible. So 10 hours of speed of processing done at home. The speed of processing task, I've just shown you a, slot, a, a screenshot of it, um, it basically involves, it's actually a visual selective attention task based on the useful field of view. I don't know if anybody has heard of that. That's a driver screening test. Now, what was really significant, the, 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 
study went for, for 10 weeks, they did the intervention, and then the researchers assessed the cognition of these 600 participants after 12 months, and they looked at the results for middle-aged adults and older adults, and they found that there was improvement on the tests that they'd been trained on, which is what we've seen in many, many studies, but they also showed quite significant improvements in a number of other neuropsychological tests, and, and they actually then, using normative data, were able to convert this into years of cognitive ageing sort of saved or gained. And it's quite significant. So, for example, on the symbol digit modalities test, the at-home group gained 5.9 years in their speed of processing score. So this is a fairly simple intervention. These are older adults, and this is just a really good example of neuroplasticity, and it, and it sort of opens up a whole lot of potential of what we possibly could be doing. What, what's the future going to look like in terms of interventions for people in midlife, in um, early old age and in older age, in terms of... Um, brain development to prevent cognitive decline. The next, the fourth concept I want to introduce is that multiple domains of risk and protective factors. So when we're looking at cognitive development over the life course, that trajectory I showed you, there's influences, positive and negative, that really impact on that trajectory. And obviously we all want to know what they are so we can do the right things to minimise any cognitive impairment in late life. Um, I don't have time to go through them all. I can refer anybody who's interested to a number of re review articles. Basically, we now know there's a number of risk factors. There tend to be the same risk factors as those for cardiovascular disease. And there's a number of protective factors, and they tend to, to um, revolve around education, cognitive engagement, and a healthy diet and social engagement. But what this means is that no one discipline can approach this problem of enhancing cognitive function. We need a multidisciplinary approach. We need a multi-sectorial approach. Some of these things relate to air pollution, some of them relate to medical conditions, some relate to lifestyle, some are education. So if we want to have a society with optimal cognitive function, we need to be approaching it from a whole range of um, disciplines and sectors. Now, there's been a lot of statistical modelling done on the epidemiological work to look at the population attributable risk, and there's been seven of, of risk factors for dementia. There's seven key risk factors which should, have been shown to account for 28 to 30 per cent of cases of dementia worldwide. Um, they include diabetes, midlife hypertension, midlife obesity, physical inactivity, depression, smoking, and low educational attainment. Worldwide, if we had to do one thing to reduce dementia prevalence and incidence, it would be to increase education in low-income countries. In Australia, it's really to re reduce um, inactivity and treat depression. So um, I put forward this model, a cognitive health environment life course model, to try to um, put all this information together so that we can develop some public policy responses because it's such a complex area. Um, we need to have a, quite a broad understanding, but when you go to policymakers, we want to be able to, or when we're thinking, this is more about us thinking about approaching policymakers and the different components and what, where we would, what sort of um, government department or what sort of policymaker we would approach with which, which components. So i thinking first is the independent variables of genetics, environment, demography and lifestyle. The disease risk factors are stress and cardiometabolic factors. The diseases in themselves that are important for cognitive function are depression, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Then we have all the neuropathological changes. Then we have this wonderful thing here called reserve that we're still learning a lot about. Um, we can intervene in and all of those things combine to lead to what you end up with with your cognitive function. There's a lot of scope for behavioural and policy intervention um, in terms of environment, um, education and lifestyle. So we know air pollution is linked to um, dementia and Alzheimer's pathology. So we know in Mexico City that children exposed to very high levels of air pollution are already showing Alzheimer's pathology and that's an area where we need to um, look at, at a much more global or um, high level public policy level. We know um, a lot now in, with public health, we're trying to address risk factors for obesity and diabetes. So now we're saying, well, let's put dementia in there as well and uh, link all of this information together. Um, and with behavioural interventions, we've got interventions that work for stress and depression. We know that there's pharmacotherapy to treat cardiometabolic risk factors for depression, diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease. So the message in terms of um, optimising cognitive health is to treat those cardiovascular um, risk factors in midlife, manage hypertension and hypercholesteremia. Um, and then we also know that we can improve cognitive reserves through cognitive training and through lifelong learning and education. So that's another area that we need to be working on. 
So just future research, I think we need to prioritise healthy environments and educational opportunities for children and adolescents, even though we're talking about healthy ageing. It needs to start um, from birth or in prenatal. We need to remove toxic exposures, air pollution, and prevent brain injury. Um, the policies and public policies need to support brain health over the life course, so preventing things before they happen, particularly head injury um, and air, air, exposure to air pollution. Um, there's a huge amount of work to be done on investigating neuroplasticity um, in, you know, what's the best intervention, how, how much plasticity is there. For example, um, chemotherapy, should we be using cognitive training straight after chemotherapy given we know that that um, causes some cognitive changes, things like that. There's a huge, a lot of, there's just endless research questions there. Um, and we need to probably most importantly critically evaluate our assumptions about normal versus normative cognitive development. Because we assume that it's normal to decline as we age, we may not take, um, ask the right questions about, well, what could we do to intervene to enhance cognitive ability? So perhaps challenging our own kind of age stereotypes and expectations about ageing are important as well. That's all. Thank you. Uh Professor Anstey for a perfectly timed presentation which gave the chair no work at all to do. We'll take questions at the end. So you can join me up here and keep me company. Um, you get to practice your neck exercises if you do that. <laughs> and uh, if I could welcome our next speaker, Dr. Tim Windsor, up here to the, um, to the, the elevated uh, stage. Now, Everyone has very long titles, I've discovered, in this panel. Tim is the Australian Research Council Future Fellow and Deputy Director of the Flinders Centre for Ageing Studies, Flinders University, and Associate Investigator of CEPA. And Tim is talking about social connectedness, engagement, and well-being, or oh, ageing well, and we welcome him. Thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to uh, talk rather more specifically about one particular empirical investigation um, that I've been involved with, looking at correlates of social activity engagement in oldest old adulthood using data from the Australian Longitudinal Study of Ageing. So as Karen, Karen pointed out, uh, remaining socially engaged might in fact be one of the uh, important protective factors that come into play in protecting against cognitive decline. And it's also the case that social engagement for some time now has been regarded as a, a defining characteristic of ageing well by gerontologists as well as by older adults themselves. And there are a number of reasons why social engagement is regarded as being important. Um, a number of studies indicate links between social activity and health, and it's thought that remaining socially engaged um, has can have a positive influence on one's health through the positive um, input of one's social partners. Um, having social support can reduce negative appraisals of potentially stressful events. Uh, social support can have a direct impact on wellbeing when people are faced with adverse circumstances. And it's also likely that uh, remaining positively engaged and having a vibrant social network can contribute to one's positive emotional experiences that in turn have uh, potentially beneficial effects on health. Now, a number of studies have looked at links between social activity and health outcomes, but few have actually looked at the antecedents of change in social activity in later life. And those studies that have have tended to take resource-based perspectives where a focus is on ageing-related losses, such as declines in health and cognition or the death of network members, leading to a decreased level of social engagement. And other studies have, and theories have taken more of a, a psychological or or personal agency focused perspective that actually recognises the role of the individual in shaping their own social world as they get older. And one of the uh, more influential theories in this area is socio-emotional selectivity theory, which posits that as people become older, they become more aware of the fact that the time remaining in their lives is limited. And as a result, they reprioritise their social networks so that they tend to discard more peripheral social network members and instead foster a smaller, closer-knit network of people who provide them with uh, high-quality emotional experiences. So these sorts of perspectives look more at the psychosocial characteristics of individuals and how they might relate to social activity. 
So in the present study, we looked at some of these issues around social activity using longitudinal data from this Australian longitudinal study of ageing. And we looked at some key health resources that fit with these resource-based perspectives to see whether uh, declines in physical and cognitive health might relate to uh, levels of activity engagement. And we also looked at socioeconomic resources, um, which is an area that I think is, has been somewhat neglected in, this, um, in the literature in this area. Uh, and it's been suggested that social disadvantage might limit opportunities for engagement through poor neighbourhood cohesion and also that better education could enhance people's social capital and the skills that they need to maintain relationships right across the life course. Finally, we looked at some psychological factors. So we considered positive affect um, with, with a view to following up some of the ideas from Fredrickson that positive emotions can, can broaden people's thoughts and behaviours leading to more diverse social experiences. And also um, the, the simpler but in some ways more compelling idea that being a, um, a happy person is more likely to attract social partners. Um, we also looked at subjective life expectancies to try and um, fit in or, or test some of these ideas associated with uh, socio-emotional selectivity theory that maybe people who perceive less time remaining in their lives are less likely to be socially engaged because they're more concerned about fostering those close relationships around them rather than fostering broader patterns of engagement. So uh, we hypothesised that better functional and cognitive health would be associated with more engagement, as would higher socioeconomic status, positive affect, and a more open-ended subjective life expectancy. So as I mentioned before, we used data from the Australian Longitudinal Study of Ageing to examine some of these questions. This is a, a study of um, uh, over 2,000 older adults from Adelaide uh, that's now been running for 22 years, although this analysis uses 18-year longitudinal data based on the, a smaller primary sample of respondents who are aged 70 or 69 to 103 at baseline. And, and uh, this analysis made use of data over six major waves of the study over 18 years. Uh, we included measures of social activity um, and uh, the, the correlates of social activity that we were interested in were functional disability and, and uh, probable cognitive impairment as defined using the mini mental state examination as our key resource focused predictors. Uh, we looked at education and people's experience of financial strain as socioeconomic indicators. And we looked at uh, positive affect using a subset of items from the uh, Center for Epidemiological Studies depression scale and subjective life expectancy by asking people how likely they felt it was that they would live another 10 years with responses ranging from very unlikely through to very likely. And we controlled for uh, baseline age, sex and partner status in the analysis. I don't need to go into details about how we did the analysis, but let me instead uh, present this figure which gives a, a sense of the broad patterns of change in social activity over time and the fact that changes in activity that occurred longitudinally did vary as a function of baseline age. So you can see that along the, the uh, x-axis of the graph we have time in study and the, the black line represents um, changes in average changes of, uh, in social activity over time among relatively younger ALSA participants and you can see that there's a, s a small decrease but not a particularly pronounced decrease um, whereas there's a much steeper decrease in, uh, among those who are older at baseline, which is not necessarily surprising. Uh, we also saw an interaction of partner status with time where those who were not partnered at baseline actually reported higher levels of social activity, suggesting perhaps a compensatory engagement of, uh, with network members outside of their spousal relationship, uh, where, however, this um, difference declined over time. So focusing now on some of the key questions that we were interested in answering, first looking at physical and cognitive health, um, these coefficients represent the, the relationship between these variables and levels of so, uh, social activity. So they, they're effectively representing between person associations. So a positive relationship would indicate that people who scored higher on a certain variable tended to also report higher levels of activity. And here we've got negative relationships for functional disability and for cognitive impairment, not surprisingly indicating that people 
with uh, more disability and, uh, and who were classified as being cognitively impaired or, or having likely cognitive impairment reported lower levels of social activity. However, we didn't find any relationships with rates of change. So um, the, the within-person trajectories of, of change in activity over time didn't actually vary as a function of these characteristics. Next, we looked at the socioeconomic variables and found that um, having higher levels of education was related to higher levels of social activity, but we didn't find a relationship between financial strain and social activity. And also, these variables weren't related to rates of change. And finally, for the psychological factors, we found significant associations where higher levels of positive affect or the experience of positive emotions was related to higher levels of social activity. And also we found a relationship with uh, future time perspective where the less likely participants thought it was that they would live another 10 years, the lower their levels of uh, social activity. And in a final model, again, there were no associations of these uh, psychological variables with rates of change. In a final model, we included the correlates together and found that the, uh, the physical health and cognitive correlates were fairly robust and, and the magnitude of those relationships stayed fairly stable. However, education became non-significant as a predictor. Positive affect and future time perspective were still related to social activity, but the magnitude of those um, associations was substantially reduced reflecting the fact that they shared variance with the physical health and, and cognitive variables. So to summarise the results, uh, functional disability and global cognition were the, most, uh, the strongest correlates of activity levels, and this probably reflects um, ageing-related resource losses resulting in restricted levels of engagement, but it's also important to remember that the, the association is likely to be bi-directional, so it's quite probable that these physical changes result in reduced activity, which in turn is likely to um, impact on health and cognition. Um, and the result, it also suggests that the results have a particular relevance to oldest old adulthood where um, these sorts of functional limitations and the likelihood of cognitive impairment be begins to become much more likely. And that, that I think also relates back to the, the point that uh, Peter MacDonald made earlier about it really being that the oldest old adulthood where a lot of these um, substantial ageing related changes are likely to have the broadest uh, policy implications. Education was associated with higher levels of activity, um, but the association was attenuated after adjusting for MMSE scores, so the global cognition scores. So this indicates that there is a shared variance among education, cognition and activity, which might actually reflect some of the ideas around cognitive reserve that Karen was talking about. Maybe um, education enhances cognitive ability, which in turn enables people to um, remain engaged for longer, but that's um, a question for future research. Positive affect was independently associated with higher activity levels, which might reflect these ideas around the, um, the broaden and build hypothesis that experiencing positive emotions broadens our behavioural and attentional uh, focus, leading to more diverse life experiences, uh, or also this possible idea that um, a positive disposition attracts social partners. Finally, subjective life expectancy was also independently related to uh, higher levels of activity fitting in with the socio-emotional selectivity idea that uh, as people perceive their time remaining as more limited, they're more likely to have a, a shrinking level of engagement. But it was also the case that this relationship was largely accounted for by controlling for the physical health and cognitive uh, variables. So this could indicate that it is in fact poor, poor health and declining function that underlies both shrinking time horizons and reduced activity and, and highlights this interplay of uh, biopsychosocial factors in shaping later life development. Um, Another point that's worth making briefly is that each of the correlates that we looked at were associated with levels of activity but not rates of change in activity. So with the ALSA data, it suggests that having this greater level of resources won't necessarily protect against 
declining activity, but at the same time, the initial advantages that were evident were still maintained over the study interval. So um, this is, uh, I guess, somewhat similar to the idea of um, preserved differentiation in the, the cognitive aging literature where these advantages might not prevent decline but might actually um, shall maintain difference. Some limitations to the study are worth uh, mentioning. There was substantial attrition due to mortality, as is the case in all longitudinal aging studies. So people who provided data at more occasions will have had a, a greater contribution to the overall estimates. We only had a three, oh, we only used a three item measure of social engagement, um, which is a, a relatively broad and non-specific measure. And it's also possible, of course, that there are other factors like personality characteristics and self-regulatory um, processes that could also relate to people's social engagement that, that we didn't have measured, so weren't able to look at in, in this study. So to conclude, we found that um, better functional health and cognition were associated uh, with higher levels, but not rates of change in social activity, as was higher positive affect and more open-ended uh, subjective life expectancy. And uh, that is it. Thank you. This is the easiest session I've ever chaired. Okay. Um, no, he's coming back. Oh, yes, come and join us up here. Could I now uh, welcome to join us as our third speaker, Dr. Richard Burns, research fellow with the ANU Centre for Research on Aging, Health and Wellbeing of the Research School of Population Health and research fellow of CEPA. Richard will be talking to us on wellbeing and improvability as national goals. And just before he takes the podium away from me, I just wanted to, uh, to mention and express my appreciation for the work that the late Gary Andrews and Mary Lush did in developing that 22 years of longitudinal data. I think uh, that we see in the academy often the traditions of the academy, and that's certainly an example of those traditions coming forward and informing the work we're doing today. Thank you very much. Um, Karen and Tim may have been easier. I will be proved to be a little bit more difficult. Um, well-being and its improvability as national goals quite clearly is an extremely uh, broad topic to discuss in a 15-minute session. So I hope what I present today um, enca uh, enca encapsulates what Hal would have wanted me to talk about. Um, Clearly, well-being is itself um, a difficult topic to decide and will have, you will have quite different meanings depending upon your own professional out, outlook. Traditionally, well-being has been defined in terms of economic growth and wealth, and more recently this has been extended to incorporate social factors including health care provision, education access and equality to name but a few. For others, well-being reflects the burden of disease and disability in the population, whilst for behavioural scientists such as myself, Questions of well-being relate to issues of psychological function and feeling, perhaps defined in terms of level of cognitive function, affect, motivation, and even spirituality. Today, I wish to focus specifically on well-being at the individual level, the existential and experiential dimensions in which we all make meaning from the experiences of our own lives. I'll then reflect on how we can might derive accounts of population of well-being that reflect the lived experiences of individuals. As a starting point for our discussion, I draw on the Bhutanese Gross National Happiness Survey, in which they try to attempt to um, measure around nine social factors that contribute to population happiness, including measures of ecology, health, community governance, culture and living standards, and importantly for a population study, personal well-being, using several different indicators. Based on their 2010 findings, we could, we could assume that around 90% of the Bhutanese population were described as happy to some extent with sufficiency across most of these domains. It paints a rather rosy picture of life in Bhutan. But the comparison with other objective measures reveals rather more troubling patterns. For instance, it ranks as poorly for life expectancy and infant mortality, consistently ranking in the bottom turtle in global comparisons. But surely, given the focus on well-being and happiness in this population survey, more positive outcomes for mental health might be expected. Surprisingly, Bhutan ranks amongst the highest for suicide rates in both sexes. It then leads me to ponder 
why population studies, such as in the Bhutan situation, are so often cited, perhaps even by some of you here today, as an example of how individual well-being can be effectively captured in population studies. There are two implications to be drawn from their experiences. First, while the Bhutan survey recognized the importance of measuring personal well-being, it's clear that government policy must first address basic social and economic needs as a priority in order for individuals to flourish and lead healthy lives. Second, in their survey, individual well-being is perhaps too narrowly defined. From a behavioral science perspective, there are significant limitations with current population approaches in the assessment of individual well-being. Traditionally informed by measures of psychological and emotional health that encompass dimensions of clinically relevant mental health outcomes, such as depression or dementia, there is an increasing scientific basis for focusing on dimensions of psychological functioning and feeling. Well-being is not a new area of research within the behavioral sciences, but it has perhaps received more considerable focus with the recent interest in positive psychology. Current well-being research can be said to derive from two perspectives. First is the hedonic or subjective well-being approach, which focuses on issues of psychological feeling, often operationalized in terms of life satisfaction, the presence of positive mood, the absence of negative mood. Second is the eudaimonic or psychological well-being approach that focuses on issues of psychological functioning, often operationalized in terms of mastery, competence, resilience, purpose in life, and self-acceptance, to name but a few. There is growing support for the thesis that psychological and subjective well-being constitute two related yet different approaches to conceptualizing well-being. Importantly, we should consider well-being as both an outcome of lives being lived well and as a driver of future living well. At this point, I think it's really important that I emphasize the distinction between well-being and mental health. For some researchers, these terms are synonymous. I disagree. I believe there is a need to clearly discriminate between mental health in terms of clinically relevant psychological disturbances with well-being as a concept related to non-clinical dimensions of psychological feeling and functioning. This emphasizes the notion that well-being is more than simply the absence of mental ill health, though this is hardly a revolutionary idea. Over 60 years ago, the WHO's constitutional preamble emphasized health as a state of well-being, not simply the absence of disease or infirmity, echoing the narrative of thinkers like Kierkegaard, who emphasized that the good life is not one free of angst, but one lived with regard of it. But given my earlier description of the ways in which well-being can be operationalized, it is surprising that life satisfaction and satisfaction with different life domains, such as with work and relationships, remain the most frequently utilized measure of individual well-being in population studies. For instance, the National Surveys of Mental Health and Well-Being provide substantial descriptions of clinical mental health, but in terms of um, well-being, uh, is simply operationalized in terms of life satisfaction. There have been and remain still considerable questions pertaining the utility of satisfaction as a suitable index of well-being. Let us consider two examples. First is the purported association between happiness and satisfaction with income. The relationship is not strong. Across different nations and cultures, Easterland's paradox describes increases in income with no substantial changes in population happiness or satisfaction. Second, as an aging focus symposium, we may well ask what is the association between life satisfaction and age? Frequently a curvilinear relationship between age and satisfaction is described, but in which direction? Baird and colleagues recently reviewed data from the German and British household panel studies and found stable life satisfaction in the German population until age 70. Whilst the British population reported increases in midlife with substantial declines in late life. In contrast, in Australia, Heady and Warren identified life satisfaction as lowest in midlife and this corresponds quite well with what we know about increased suicide rates in midlife, particularly for men. Global reports of subjective well-being are susceptible to cultural differences and typically biased by recency effects and extreme events. Kahneman argues that global subjective well-being indi indicators are susceptible to current mood, context, comparative groups, and survey design. 
Some of our own research has critically examined the utility of satisfaction as a measure of lives living well and as a predictor of future lives being lived well. We can frame this in two ways. Simply, in comparison with these other well-being indicators, how well does life satisfaction predict future health outcomes? And two, is life satisfaction as sensitive to the impact of negative life events when they do occur? I present findings from the Path Through Life study that Karen was referring to earlier. Um, but overall, the unique effect of life satisfaction was only weakly associated with increased risk of subsyndromal and minor depression. Whilst a stronger effect on major depression was reported, the effect of low positive affect was consistently one and a half to two and a half times the effect of low satisfaction, whilst the effect of high negative affect was consistently two and a half to four times the effect of low life satisfaction. Clearly, affect was more strongly related to subsequent mental health outcomes. We then examine the effect of life events on life satisfaction in comparison with these affect dimensions, but then extended this to include two indicators of psychological well-being, operationalized here in terms of mastery and resilience, as well as a measure of ma major depression. Of the possible 65 contrasts between life satisfaction and these other well-being measures, over 50% of these effects reported stronger impacts of life events on the other well-being and mental health indicators. Simply, these additional well-being indicators were more sensitive to the impact of life events than life satisfaction. Karen's already previously referred to Beddington and colleagues featured Nature article and the findings of the UK Foresight Mental Capital and Wellbeing Report, in which they highlighted the importance of examining the range of human behaviours and feelings throughout the life course. Relatedly, Felicia Huppert, who worked on those pro projects, has led a team to develop a multidimensional well-being module for the European Social Survey that systematically assessed key well-being variables, including positive and negative emotions, engagement, purpose and meaning, optimism and trust, life satisfaction, as well as satisfaction with specific domains of life. It's possible now, having been implemented in the ESS survey, to make between-country comparisons in a range of these psychological and functioning and feeling indicators, for instance, here with purpose and life. Unfortunately, a comparison study in Australia is not available. However, some of our own findings from different existing longitudinal Australian studies provide evidence of the utility for incorporating additional measures of individual well-being in future population surveys. For example, again, using data from the PATH study, we have provided strong, theoret strong evidence for a theoretical model that describes how psychological well-being functioning drives subjective well-being, which in turn are significant predictors of depression and anxiety. Again, using PATH, but within a cross, uh, work stress context, we've demonstrated that psychological well-being indicators are more sensitive to the impact of work strain than subjective well-being and mental health, and that this is maintained over a four-year period. For example, work strain was strongly consistent with, uh, strongly associated with con concurrent depression, but not with depression four years later. Far more effects on subjective well-being are reported, but note the stronger effect sizes of positive effect in comparison with the traditional life satisfaction measure. But again, four years later, most of these effects had dissipated. Most notable was that the effect of work strain on the psychological well-being outcomes was consistent over time. Within the context of late life, uh, my colleagues and I have used longitudinal population data to demonstrate that vitality as one measure of psychological feeling is a stronger predictor than mental health of self-rated health, falls and mortality risk. Specifically, well-being attenuates the effects of mental health on these outcomes and of mo most important for our notion of improvability we identified that increasing well-being was associated with increased self-rated health and reduced falls and mortality risk. Finally, I wish to talk about an issue of, um, which we've recently been looking at in terms of the, from the HILDA study using 10 years of, long, 10 years of longitudinal data to examine how well-being and mental health interact to contribute to flourishing and languishing. In this instance, I define flourishing in terms of possessing both good well-being and mental health languishing in terms of possessing poor well-being and poor mental health. Findings suggest that possessing both well-being and good mental health confers benefits than simply being high in one or the other on a range of health and satisfaction outcomes. 
In terms of health outcomes, flourishes are more clearly significantly better off than languishes and those who were average on both well-being and mental health dimensions. Similar findings for satisfaction with various life domains are also reported. However, the question to then be asked is whether well-being or mental health are driving these effects. By comparing flourishes with those who are high in mental health but with medium well-being at the blue line and low well-being, the red line, we can clearly see the large impact varying well-being has on a number of selected health outcomes. In contrast, by comparing flourishes with those who are high in well-being but with medium mental health and low mental health, we can clearly see that the impact of varying mental health is not as substantial as was the effect of varying vitality. Similar effects are reported for languishes with varying well-being having more substantial effects than lower mental health. Simply, possessing both good well-being and mental health is important, but in addition, high well-being is, is a more substantial driver of positive outcomes for flourishes, and low well-being is a substantial risk for poorer outcomes in languishes. I hope these findings give some indication of the need to expand on our current methods of tapping personal well-being. It then leaves me to argue how well-being and provability may then fit within public health policy. First, we should recognize that well-being is interrelated with all parts of the individual, including their physical health and life experiences. For example, Riff and colleagues have identified psychological well-being to be strongly related to a number of biological health markers, including lower cortisol and noradrenaline, improved cardiovascular and immune functioning. Tim referred to Barbara Fredrickson's work uh, in the broad and build theory that describes how positive life experiences, positive emotions, and positive psychological functioning are all strongly interrelated. In a clinical context, father and colleagues developed well-being therapy as a form of cognitive behavioral therapy that specifically focuses on so psychological well-being components such as mastery, purpose, and self-acceptance. In randomized clinical trials, their findings indicated relapse in only 40% of those who under uh, took well-being therapy in comparison to 90% relapse in the CBT only group. Their method has been utilized as part of health and social development classes in schools with great effect on reducing psychological distress and improving a sense of well-being in students. There is clearly a strong scientific basis that improving personal well-being is within the scope of public policy. As an example, the New Economics Foundation was tasked with developing an evidence-based policy for promoting well-being within the UK, developing the Five Ways to Well-Being program that focuses on engaging individuals to connect with others, be active life participants, take time to notice people in the world around them, continue to strive for learning and knowledge, and express gratitude through giving to others. Its impact has been far-reaching. I captured the figure in the top right of the screen as I walked through the door into the Sheffield Council Chambers early in this year as part of the Institute of Work Psychology Conference. Sheffield Act Council actively promotes the five ways to wellbeing policy amongst its councillors and constituents. And indeed, the, the policy has, has impact on local and national governments worldwide, including the New Zealand Mental Health Foundation, Australia's Sunshine Coast Council, and the UK NHS. As I draw to a conclusion, I should emphasize that I'm not here to promote a Pollyanna view of the world with all this well-being jargon. Personally, much of the well-being and positive psychology movement leaves me rolling my eyes at times. There can be too much of a good thing. Sometimes we just don't feel competent or optimistic. Sometimes we do feel down about things in our lives, and sometimes we do feel all at sea, adrift with no particular direction in our life's journey. Such feelings are a normal part of human existence, and given the context, may well be appropriate. But it is only in recognizing the complexity of the lived experience that relevant population policy can be developed to enhance and improve the lives of individuals. A concerted national approach to capture the variety of human well-being experiences as lived as needed, as is the development of a set of national policy guidelines that might direct the facilitation of individuals' well-being and their engagement with work and community. But this implies a willingness of governments, advocates, and researchers to reframe their outdated and rather simplistic understanding of what it means to live well. Thank you. Well, now I have my panel on the stage where I know where they are, unlike at the beginning of this session. I would uh, like to thank them all right now, in case I forget to do that later.
And now I'll uh, open up the sessions for the session for question and answers from the panel. If you don't have a question, then I will ask a question about the distinction between longitudinal and cohort analysis, and you'll all be asleep for hours. Thank you. Uh, Karen, as someone who recently took oh, up Sudoku. Sorry, could you just identify oh, sorry, Lip from the Curtin University in Western Australia. Uh, as someone who recently took up Sudoku, um, can you comment? There was a, a recent press release from the Institute of Center for Longevity at Stanford University and the uh, Max Planck uh, Institute for Developmental Psychology, uh, who had an expert meeting evaluating the effectiveness of brain trainings. Uh, basically, their conclusion was that at best, the statements of the effectiveness of brain trainings are overstated. And certainly as far as transfer, either near transfer or long transfer actually occurs, there's no evidence for it whatsoever. Um, that's not completely correct. So they are overstated, I agree, but there is evidence of transfer, including long transfer from the active trial that was published in JAMA, and they've now got 10 year follow-up data. And they have shown speed of processing training transferred to um, activities of daily living, um, uh, uh, delayed driving cessation, and a number of other um, functional outcomes. So the active trial has, is the best data so far. There has been, there's a real, um, problem, a lot of the more experimental cognitive studies haven't looked at applied types of transfer, they've just looked at transfer to a similar cognitive test. So I agree that we do need to conduct a lot more studies where they have transfer to meaningful outcomes. Um, the other thing is that there isn't any evidence yet that um, brain training reduces your risk of dementia. There's been no study that's actually followed anyone up for dementia. So, but there is evidence from neuroimaging studies we can actually see um, increase in cortical thickness after brain training. So I agree there's a number of issues. Uh, Hal. Hal Kendig. <laughs> Uh, those are outstanding presentations in terms of what I would view as mainly technical psychology and really important topic areas. My question now is a public affairs question. What do each of you think? You're experts in your area. You're also citizens of the world. Is it possible to connect ideas of well-being to public policy? Things like living longer, living better the aspirations in Europe, Richard, for well-being. Is there some way that we can connect the actions of government to these outcomes for people? And I say that I'm going to have to run away at some point for a radio interview, but not because of the answers that are coming. <laughs> so, uh, Richard, would you like to go first, or? Um, um, it's a really easy question. I mean, well, Tim, do you want to help him out while he thinks? Well, I, I'll, I'll answer your question with a with an answer that may not be the one that may not be a particularly appropriate one, but I'll I'll try, and that will give Richard more time to think. Um, so, one th one thing that uh, I've been looking at lately, Hal, is something that you I know has been an interest of yours in the past, and that's work around um, environmental gerontology and intergenerational communities. And um, I think that's an example of one area where there is a real opportunity to, um, to have some kind of broader policy related um, changes that could help communities of different ages to um, live without the segregation that characterises some um, older communities at the moment and in, in, in ways that create intergenerational spaces that help um, interaction between um, people of different generations in ways that could enhance the sorts of aspects of social engagement and intergenerational transfer that might um, uh, help to generally promote well-being and, and help to maintain engagement among older adults. So that's, that's just one thought off the top of my head as a, as a potential area of, um, of value. K Karen, did you want to have a go or Richard? Well, I think um, it's about 
A lot of it's about setting um, policy objectives and aspirations that encompass, encompass wellbeing and, and um, it's like having a definition of health that includes cognitive health, not just physical health. Um, so it, that's what the UK government did with the foresighting project. It actually developed that framework and there's no reason why we can't do that here. And I think a lot of it comes back to ageism and our implicit assumptions about what ageing well should be like. Um, and if we challenge some of those assumptions and frame it more positively and set higher aspir aspirations, then that will flow into the way we frame policy. Karen made mention to the Foresight um, report, which has influenced, I, I mean, I mentioned it in my, in my abstract, um, there's the Foresight report and its impact on the UK government's approach now to measuring population wellbeing. They're actually going to win people themselves and asking what makes uh, their lives good, what, 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 in, what, what is it that will drive their flourishing. And you even see it now in the OECD with their Better Life initiative very similarly are, are going to people themselves to identify what it is that drives their flourishing and, and their sense of engagement with, with community and with family and work. I might also mention the, um, that uh, in South Australia we have a thinker in residence program where, um, I, I think it's actually finished now, but for a number of years, experts from different fields across um, from different parts of the world were brought to South Australia to um, help to develop ideas around policy that might enhance different aspects of, um, of life. And we, we had, um, many of you would be aware that we had uh, Alexander Calachet, who's an expert in um, age-friendly cities. But uh, subsequent to that, we had Martin Seligman, who's a um, um, prominent figure in, in positive psychology. And uh, I, I know there are a lot of divergent views about just how appropriate some of his ideas are, but they seem to have, um, he seems to have left something of a legacy in South Australia. And I believe in a number of schools, they're implementing policies around promoting well-being among students based on some of his ideas. Um, so uh, I guess that's just another small scale example of how some of these ideas are being applied in, a, um, in an effort to, to promote population well-being. So uh, before Hal runs away, before we go to our next question, I'd just uh, add that it's often the case that when we look at some of the data, it seems clear that if you're wealthy, if you're well-educated, and if you're healthy and fit, you're going to do better in older age. So, so one of the ways of thinking about policy is to ask the question, how can policy, how can services substitute for some of those things? And perhaps one of the most obvious examples is around transport. If you have a driver, a Rolls Royce at your disposal, probably getting around is not a problem. If you've got to travel by bus and if you are not near a bus stop, it's more of an issue. So how does, how can policy substitute for not being in the advantaged 10 or 15% who have all of those assets? We have a question from on high from the gods. Uh, from Anne, Anne Cutler, University of Western Sydney, and thank you very much for sending the microphone up here. Um, I'll stand up so that more people can see me. Um, there is evidence that not all social interactions are, are created equal. That is to say that interacting in old age with your age mates and your old friends um, is more cognitive, more use to you cognitively than, than sitting around chatting with your, your kids and grandkids. At least there's at least one Finnish study that, that, that um, shows that. The oldest old don't often have that option because they may be the last of their cohort, given, give, giving rise to the most common complaint in old age that everybody's died, right? <laughs> so all I'd like to ask is, is there any relevant e research on this topic that um, that your your center or your your um, uh, readings can can um, uh, bring to bear. Thank you. Uh, did everyone hear the question? I think that uh, all of our speakers have something to contribute on that, but I'll let them pick their own order. Okay. Well, I'll go first, and uh, I think it's a very valid point, and I think um, the research around uh, aging and social relationships. 
uh, shares the limitation of a lot of ageing related research in that there really hasn't been that much work done with the oldest old relative to the young old um, adults um, for whom social life is, is often very um, vibrant and dynamic and, and I would argue perhaps at, at, a, at peak levels across the life course. So um, it, it's an important point and I think it's not only the, it's important to recognise that not only do um, are positive interactions unequal, but we also need to recognise that not all interactions are positive and that um, a lot of interactions can be um, characterised by negativity and tensions and, uh, and that can often also be expressed in, in the context of support relationships as well, where when people need social support, often the quality of those relationships is compromised because of the difficulties around um, not, no longer being independent and having to rely on others. So um, I, I still think research is emerging in those areas, but I think researchers in social gerontology are becoming more and more aware of the complexities and um, hopefully um, are working towards addressing some of those questions in more comprehensive ways. Um, other of our speakers want to respond or go to another question? No, I think that's... Um, we have three in a row, um, front to back, I think the order was, but never mind, we'll do back to front. No, you're, no, you first. The man <coughs> Leon with the Mann, microphone. Leon Mann, University of Melbourne. Um, the question, I think, is related, relates to how we can maintain independence amongst the people who would otherwise sink into dependency and therefore become not only more and more dependent upon medication and on the whole healthcare system support and depend upon visits to the general practitioner, uh, practitioner every week for you know, an aspirin or some, some attention, uh, but also how they can get around and how they can do things and socially engage. And of course, with that, I think we have to go beyond psychology into engineering and assistive health technologies. And about three weeks ago, I was at a, um, uh, the, the launch of a report, which was an ECOLA uh, project. ECOLA, for those uh, who don't know, it's the roof body of the four academies. And the project was spearheaded by the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. And there's some really remarkable stories of how Using smart technology, you can maintain the independence of a lot of people. You can protect them from falls, from uh, being isolated. They can connect. Uh, so there are a whole lot of things that one can do which have got very, very strong policy implications. Uh, but it does mean that we have to really engage you know, with other disciplines, uh, and in particular smart engineers who, can, who are coming up with some very, very bright ideas. Uh, while I have the mic, um, Around about 30 years ago, there was a fascinating study, might even be longer, by Ellen Langer and Judy Roden. I remember it well because I studied decision making. And what they found was in uh, a residential care home, the people who lived longest, who, who stayed alive longest, and, and were least dependent upon medication, were those who were given choices. Uh, it was a field experiment in which they actually created for, one, for the experimental condition, uh, interventions in which they had choices about the colours of the curtains, uh, what they would have uh, on their evening meal, where they would go on an excursion to this particular place or that particular place, and just giving them control over their choices and giving them that independence was quite remarkable, remarkably so. It's, ever, it's stuck to me ever since. I wonder if you can embed in the whole cognitive apparatus of you know, problem solving and memory and learning, more place for choice and decision making and maintaining that because I think it's very, very valid, very important. So panel, is this where we go to self-efficacy um, or will we take just two more quick questions and let you answer all three at once? I'm conscious we've got about five minutes left. We have two more questions. Do you think you can, you, you don't have notes, do you? Um, okay, quick I, I answer. Just, I, could, I could just say that um, the topic of, of uh, perceived control is a, um, 
is very much recognised as a really important um, area in terms of ageing and also people's um, self-regulation and adaptation and, and all the work around goals and knowing when to when to set goals and engage with them, but also importantly, when to disengage with goals that are no longer attainable and being able to find that right balance um, is seen as a, a really important um, self-regulatory um, skill in terms of ageing well. And I, and I think that's another emerging area that we'll see more research from in the, in the coming years. And a connection to stress between control and stress levels from memory? Well, it's recognised as a, as a really important moderating factor that, um, that people who have these strong perceptions of control are typically better able to deal mm. with, with stress. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, Norman Etherington. And you'd could up. I, I'm, I'm very sorry, we, we, we have only now four minutes or so left. Can I ask you to make it a shorter ask, question than some? Yes, UWA. Um, uh, you offer data showing that people who have higher levels of income, education and so forth, um, have higher levels of uh, well-being and those who have issues with health or mental things or low educational status and so forth do worse and that individuals raising their own income uh, doesn't matter much in terms of well-being but none of you offered um, reference to a study I don't want to ask you what about what you haven't done but uh, studies that uh, asked whether inequality itself made a difference by comparing mm. Uh, groups in different situations. It may be that Bhutan does better here than, than, than it might in other ways. Um, anyone want to respond to that or just take it as an interesting comment? I'll just mention some recent analyses that we're doing with, with the same data set looking at financial strain as a predictor of health outcomes and, and we found that indeed people with high levels of financial strain um, have poorer health outcomes but that is also um, buffered to a degree by quality of social relationships. So um, I think it's a really important point, but again, I think it's one of these multiple interacting factors that um, um, can be, can have a greater negative impact for some people without the other constellation of, of coping resources um, than relative to others. And uh, I think, and part of this is the relative inequality as distinct from absolute measures of inequality um, from my memory of many hours of analysing the crime statistics for my brother-in-law when I was a PhD student in the National Library here, the, the relative being an important aspect of this and in your work as well, if my memory of your work serves me, which it may not. Did we have a, another question? Oh, go on, just give, it, give us a quick burst. Show us how a short question is done. Yeah, oh, yeah. Jeff Harcourt. Um, this is a real politic uh, question. Given the low standard of public debate and intelligence in our parliamentarians at the moment, do you think <laughs> that they have the will to respond to the things that you're finding out and the suggestions that you're making so that you have a better informed and more critical band of Wrinkleys? <laughs> okay, um, I think that's a yes, yes, no question. Would anyone like to uh, offer anything more? No, they're not going to. I, I put my faith. I put my faith in the public service. So there. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, um, could I thank you all for your participation? I think it's been a wonderful afternoon session. Three wonderful papers, beautifully timed, uh, and. Uh, despite the chair failing to start us on time. So thank you to our speakers, thank you to our questioners.